Okay, let's keep on this role model thing in the battle for integration. Only now I'm going to shift, having described the problem, to the Bible itself, because the Bible actually does this. It presents the battle of integration for each one of the named heroes. And we're not paying enough attention to the kinds of things that are said and left out to notice that this is the story that God's telling. The whole message of the Bible is, Hi, yes, you're putts, and God remakes you. Okay, but what does that mean? What does it mean to be Christ-like? And, of course, you know, tainted as we are with all of our stereotypes... We think that being Christ-like is you do good deeds and you're always nice and you never swear or drink or all the other stupid things, okay, that people think are spiritual. They're not spiritual. And we don't recognize that the Bible never, how do you want to call it, confirms our stereotypes. It's got a whole different story it tells but we don't really pay attention to it, so we don't notice. Okay, and I've told this story before, but now look at the same facts from the idea that God is telling you role models. We kind of get that part. But what does that mean in God's eyes, in God's words, in God's story, and why is he telling you this story about somebody else? Okay, first role model, Adam, well, actually, first role model is Satan, but you don't find out about him till later. First role model we learn about is Adam and the woman. And what is told, what are you told? Adam runs around naming the animals. And there's nobody but him and the animals and God. That's all you know. So he's not telling you anything about what's going on in Adam's head. Until the day when God says, well, where, you know, he's being sort of sarcastic. Where is there anybody that's, you know, the same kind as Adam? There isn't anybody, is it? Well, I better make a help, helper for Adam. It's really funny, actually. You know, because Adam's seeing all the animals, you know, have sex. But where's somebody with whom he can have sex? There ain't nobody. So, oh, God puts him to sleep and takes a rib out. And all of a sudden, oh, there she is. And what does Adam go? My pastor loved talking about this. At last. <laughs> Oh boy, now I can have sex too. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Here's, well, I'm going to call her Esha because she came out of man. Which is funny because the word for man in Hebrew is Ish. The A ending makes it feminine now. A feminine now. Esha, okay? So it's really very witty in the Hebrew. Coming out of man. You don't get that. See, he goes into her with what? His phallus. And she's coming out of man from the rib, so he's going into her. It's a sexual analogy. And, of course, her first kid, she names after his phallus. Cain, Cain means spear. Now, do I have to explain what a spear does? Okay. It's very sexual. This is not, I mean, that's why they don't teach you this stuff in, in the pulpits, you know, because, oh, sex is verboten. Okay, but then you miss a whole side of God's humor. Okay, this is just so different a story from what they teach you in Sunday school. And it's really God's word. And, of course, somebody's going to say in one of the comments, oh, you're being dirty, brain up. A God invented sex. Get used to it or get out. Okay? I don't do it. You know, I'm by myself. I'm not getting married. 
I don't do it. Not in any way. Because that's not the way he designed it. He designed sex for marriage between man and woman, okay, and it's meant to be enjoyable. It is not meant to where you have to, you know, grin and bear it. I don't know why the religionists want to turn God's beauty into ugliness, but they do. This is the kind of story he tells. This is our role model. A couple that's having sex at, as often as possible. So much so that it's on their mind and they even name their kids. The first kid born is Cain. Cain, it means spear. And because you spear something and catch it, please don't make me have to under explain that. It comes to mean acquirer. And so the, you know, the, the what do you want to call it? The ascetic translators cover that up by just saying acquirer in their lexicons. My pastor wasn't so ascetic. He explained this to us. Because it's there in the text. That tells you the kind of role model that God is. Humorous. All-encompassing. Get the analogy? Now, that's our first role model. And what do they do? Well, they're having a great time. And along comes Satan, and he kind of wants to mess it up. So he sidles into the woman, not, not Adam. And says, well, you know, the God say you can't eat from any of these trees? Big lie. Typical exaggeration in order to lie. And she's all, well, no, you can only eat from the one. And she knows it's Satan talking. Satan's using her pet serpent, who in those days had legs. So that tells you a lot about their lifestyle and their character. She's, I mean, she knows it's Satan. So why is she talking to him? Because she's bored. Because she's disgruntled. And Satan's playing Mr. Cute. He's not showing himself the way he really is. So she won't be intimidated. And it's not like Adam is away somewhere. He's right there. Because he's certainly right there when she eats the fruit. So how many of these conversations was he actually sitting there and doing nothing? So what does that tell you? You see, you have to look at what the text says and what it doesn't say. And it's like, well, this is what it says. So what does that mean about this, that, and the other thing? You have to play with it. And it tells you a lot about God. He's not hitting you over the head with the meaning. He wants you to play with it. He wants you to figure it out for yourself. Which means he wants you to be free to do that. There's your role model. And it's not... You know, it's not a bunch of do's and don'ts and, oh, we're being, you know, prissy. None of that. So what does that tell you about role models? And it's very, I don't know, how do you want to call it? Down to earth. Down to earth stuff. You know, Satan exaggerating. We all do that. We can identify with it. It's something memorable. It's something that you can relate to. It's not some high granite, you know, chiseled pedestal thing. It's down to earth where you live on a daily basis. Okay? Uh, you know, you don't want me to repeat all the details. You know the details. And yet, what do you really know about those details? The same thing when it comes to Abraham. You get, you, the stories. It's like, just go through the stories. Just talk to God while you read the stories. You know them and yet you don't know them. What does he say? What does he not say? Why does he say what he says? And when you play with it, you realize, wait a minute. These aren't some, you know, holy people on some pedestal. But just like you and me. 
And he doesn't leave out the warts. They're rather prominent. The biggest heroes in Bible committed the biggest sins to. What does that tell you? If they can be, what do you want to call it, saved and developed by God, so can you. They're not remote. They're not on Mount Olympus. They're not, you know, what do you want to call it, Terminator or Green Lantern. Although the later stories that have been, you know, told about those, those, you know, the latest movies that have been coming out with like Ryan Reynolds and all that, they're they're more human. But the older versions, the early versions of all these stories were like distant. The original versions were rather, rather prurient. A lot of sex involved. You know, the, the whole story with the Greek gods and all that. It's always a lot of war and fighting and sex. Because the Greeks were trying to make them more down to earth too. They were just bigger and better than you. But they had all the same, you know, psychological problems. They had all the same wars, family problems, fathers and sons fighting each other, killing each other. I mean, you're told about Cain and Abel fighting each other. Why is that a story? Why does God tell that story? It, you know, according to Christians and what they think the Christian life is, their stereotype, is that everybody should be sitting on harps in heaven, all singing to each other. Where is that in the Bible? All the Bible stories, frankly, if Hollywood would really pay attention to them, those would all be blockbuster movies. Everything that every Hollywood producer wants to try and turn into a script, into a movie, he, he hadn't seen nothing yet. There's not a single movie that's ever been made in Hollywood that could even begin to have the blockbuster potential of a Bible story. But they never tell it right. They always sugar it up. I mean, most of the stories about Christ in the, you know, in the Bible movies are so horrible they're nothing like the actual story in the Bible. I mean, they've, they've gotten better over the years, but those early movies in the 1950s and 1960s are horrible. Just horrible. One of the worst of the movies, you know, is Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. Awful. Just, just, look. And all the other Moses stories have been bad ever since. They've never told that story right. I mean, you know, just, oh. Even really good actors like Ben Kingsley and DuGrace Scott. Horrible movies. Absolutely horrible. Ab no relationship to scripture at all. And that other one that just came out, the other Moses, wasn't it with, uh, whatchamacallit, Russell Crowe or something. The Noah movies, horrible. Horrible. But just nobody cares what the scripture actually says. And of course, the movies don't do well at the box office. Primarily because people know better, because they know what the story is, and they look at the movie and they're like, well, this doesn't have anything to do with Bible. So then, you know, they wasted all their money. It's a kiss of death, you know, in, in Hollywood. It's pretty much, if you're going to play a Bible character, it's because you can't get any other part. Well, if they made the movie the way the Bible actually tells the story, everybody and his brother would want to be in those parts because it's really saucy. Okay? Really, really saucy. There's intrigue, there's murder, there's all the things that Hollywood wants to show and glamorize. Quentin Tarantino couldn't, do, couldn't even begin to show the violence that the Bible's trying to tell you. I mean, come on, the demons copulated with the whole human race. That's why the flood had to happen. They can't even, that would be such an X-rated movie, you couldn't even begin to put it on TV. The Christians would be against it, even though it's a true Bible. I mean, you, you cannot imagine just the orgies. 
I mean, the ancient story that the Bible is telling you, okay, I, you, you know, you're probably going to flinch, but I, I got to be honest, is that the demons were copying with all the women they could. And in the meanwhile, what they really want to do is destroy the human race. So they promulgated a kind of religion where you had to have sex or you put any kids you had into the arms of a statue and then set it on fire while it was still alive. And of course the baby's screaming and you're supposed to enjoy the screaming of your own kid and have sex to the screams. That was ancient religion. It was all over the world. Some version of it. Human sacrifice. Principally of your own children while you had sex while the, the suffering went on. It was supposed to excite you. In Greek religion in particular, it was whether it was homosexual or heterosexual. It was both. And it was all over. They had special, you know, the Bakken... Dionysius festivals. They had special festivals and everybody was supposed to have sex with everybody else. Uh, they, they did a play on it and called Ion by Euripides and Paul plays on that whole play. He built the whole book of Ephesians around that play. Well, if you don't know the Greek plays then you don't understand scripture. Because the Greek plays were going on even when Moses was, was doing his writing. Because they were around then. And that was the kind of religion that they practiced. It was all over the Middle East, too. But the Greeks practiced it also. Sex was a big deal. Sex was how you had relationship with God. The demons started that pre-Noah. It was the cause of the flood. And after Noah, of course, you know, the family knew of all that background and their kids just started it up again. I mean, it would be X-rated movie, actually. Now, that's the way the Bible is telling the story. And it's real important to know that. Because when you get to the Mosaic Law and you look at how strident and strict and harsh it was, you know, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, that, you know, all the atheists today condemn. You have to understand what people were like then. It was rude, crude, nasty life. It wasn't anything like we have today. In those days, you know, a man and a woman might be married to each other, but some guy from, you know, five miles away could just come in, take the woman and rape her. If her husband was like off in the field. And by the way, the relationship between husband and wife typically was terrible. He just used her as a sex object. She was there to have babies and be a sex object and cook his meals. And he didn't care about her at all. And she didn't care about him either, but at least, you know, he treated her better than some guy from five miles away who'd come in and rape her. And her husband, if he was out in the field and he found the guy raping her, then he might kill her just as easily as he'd kill him because she allowed it to happen. And people would just, you know, they'd be wandering around looking for somebody they could steal from, looking for somebody to rape, looking for somebody to peel their skin off. You, you, you just, it would be like, you know, total chaos. And that was finally why people banded together in little villages. But it wasn't much better those who were like of your tribe or your village. They stole from you, they cheated on you, they did things nasty to you. The king, most of all, it was very common, you know, you, a boy and a girl, they wanted to get married, and they usually married them off when they were very young. The king might have the first right to, to, to you know, have the woman, so that by the time she 
the king got done with her, she of course wasn't a virgin anymore for her own husband. That was very common. It was a horrible rough society. I mean, just your worst nightmare. We talk about how bad the Muslims are and the migrants are today. Well, why do you think they're that way today? That's the way it was all around the world then. They just never modernized. They're very primitive. And we, you know, we send them away from Africa into Europe. And, you know, hello, you want to know what it was like 2,000 years ago? Just look at those people. And they're actually much milder. You know, running around at night, you know, if you're a woman and you're walking in Sweden, God help you. There'll be 10, 15 guys out looking for who they can rape. Yeah, and that's what it was 2,000 years ago. For everybody. So in order to get through to these, you know, really gross humans, a set of really harsh laws ended up being developed in every society. And then when God made the Mosaic Law, he, he used that to give him a frame of reference. And he still had to be harsh. Because that's all they understood. They were cruel people all over the world. Israel was no exception. But he was going to turn her into an exception. But you got to start from somewhere. When you got a two-year-old kid, you treat him like a two-year-old. No, you can't do this. Yes, you can do that. They don't know why. Do, don't. Do, don't. Do, don't. And hopefully they grow up a little. They grow up a little. And then you can ease off a little and ease off a little. And they start to do things based on reasonings and values rather than do, don't. The whole human race was like that. And he took Israel out from amongst the nations in order to, to change and upgrade humanity. And really in many ways for all of our advancement today you, you can't find a more advanced code than the Mosaic Law. And every nation on earth has some version of it in their own constitution. We don't call it the Mosaic Law. A lot of places won't even admit it's the Mosaic Law. But those laws have a lot of, um, what do you want to call it, resonance. Because we humans are still the same humans we were two, three thousand, five thousand, six thousand years ago. Crude. We're not as crude as a populace all over the world as we used to be. But we're pretty crude. You know, look at the rape, the theft, the murder that we all do. It's nowhere near as bad as it was 2,000 years ago. And in certain ways, they were more civilized than we are now. The point I'm trying to make here is that when you're talking about role model, in the Bible, that's what it's presenting. But what's the role and what's the model? It's not what we expect. We hallucinate what the Bible is saying rather than look at it. The role was, hi, you're just a little bit above a brute animal by nature. And all throughout human history, God brings you up, brings you up, brings you up, brings you up, so that you can start to have values and relate to him. But, you know, most humans won't do that. Okay, but still, there's some kind of progress that humans can go through where they can better relate to each other instead of just kicking each other or beating each other or hurting each other or stealing from each other or raping each other or just saying, my tribe versus your tribe, my God versus your God. I mean, how childish do you have to be? But that's how we are. So the whole what we call the history of civilization is basically a gradual abandonment of the crass. I don't like what you say so I kill you. What kind of relationship is that? 
How about I don't like what you say, so I argue with you, or I don't like what you say, so I walk away, or I don't like what you say, so I try to, you know, persuade you to something else. And we call all those latter ideas more civilized. Yeah, they are. But in early society, that's not how people related to each other. Now, therefore, we learn by reading the Bible, if we pay attention, that the role of humans vis-a-vis -vis other humans was crass and low and animalistic. And as time passed, it got less so, primarily because God inserted himself in the society. Hi, I'm God. If you want to know me, you can. And some of them said yes, and most of them said no. But of those who said yes, well, they started to have better lives. And those who said no were looking at those who said yes. And the ones that said no said, well, you know what, I kind of like those better lives. So they started mimicking, aping, see, role model. The unbelievers aped the behaviors of the believers. The believers were learning those behaviors from God. And so the unbelievers benefited, even if they didn't believe in God, by aping the behaviors of the believers. And that's still going on now. Basically, where we're at as a whole human race today is based on all that. Now, of course, the unbeliever won't admit that. But to prove it, all you have to do is look at the constitutions and the laws of every country on this planet. It's all of it, some version of the Mosaic Law. They'll argue it's not, but it is. Don't murder, don't steal, don't dishonor your parents. I mean, come on. And you say, well, but a lot of those laws predated the Mosaic Law. Yeah, and who gave those laws out in the first place? Not humans. God. Eh, you know, the atheists will dispute that. But you know better. So the progress of the human race, even when they don't believe in God, is due to the role model of those who did believe in Him. And that's where all these, what we would think of as instincts, that's where they came from. Because without them, man quickly develops into animalistic behavior. Well, you can dispute that if you want. But the role model idea that God's then presenting is very human, very basic, very much down to earth. Hi, this is how you live. And therefore an Abraham or a Moses or a Paul... You see both their good points and their bad points. You see their high moments with God and their low moments. And the funny thing is that you can't name one good deed. Not one. Christians will dispute that. Yes, you can. Abraham did a lot of good deeds. Tell me where. What was Abraham's good deeds? Well, he sacrificed his son Isaac. Really? Killing your son is a good deed? Well, God told him to do it. Yeah, so was God good to tell him to do it? It's a sin to kill anybody. Well, well not necessarily anybody, but it's a sin to kill your own son. It should have been a sin for God to tell Abraham to kill his own son. And the atheist, when he's smart, will point that out. You can't say that's a good deed. Sorry. Oh, well, Moses did good deeds. He led Israel. Really? Show me. That was his office. Who gave it to him? God. How could he do it? What did he do? Well, he wrote scripture. And who enabled him to do that? Honey, have you seen the meter? 
Have you seen how brilliant that meter is in Genesis? I plotted it. The Genesis X Edge channel shows it. You think Moses came up with that on his own? The perfection of those words? How do you meter the words to actually be the timeline of history while you're writing? How did Daniel do it while he was talking? How did Paul do it while he was chained between two guards talking? You think that's human smarts? Guess again. So you can't call it a good deed. What do Christians call good deeds? Oh, putting money in the collection plate. Oh, saying how I love Jesus. And of course they'll say studying Bible. But to them, studying Bible isn't really studying Bible. It's memorizing it. It's talking about it. And why would you call that a good deed? It's just, I don't want to put this. Do you call eating your favorite food a good deed? No. You call it enjoyable. And if Bible isn't enjoyable to you, honey, it ain't a good deed either. And if it is enjoyable, then it's a God deed. Because only God can make it enjoyable. You see, this is the point that we're all missing. What kind of role and what kind of model? And what is the advertisement that God is making? Hi, it's enjoyable to have a relationship with me. It goes against your human nature, so there is that problem. And that part of it hurts, because you're going against yourself. But don't you go against yourself when you want to have something that you enjoy? You have to go against your nature when you go after something you really want. You see the point? It's a different role, and it's a different model, and all these are down-to-earth people that had their struggles, and they had really big failures. And God doesn't hide them. And where can you really say that anybody in history, in the Bible, did a good deed? Even Christ. What good deed did he do? And everybody will say, oh, but he died on the cross. Yeah, and how did he do that? Well, he, he, he allowed himself to be on the cross. He paid for sins. How did he do that? Your average Christian doesn't even know. He died for sins. What does that mean? They think he died physically for sins. That's not what the Bible says. By means of his truth knowledge, he makes righteous. Well, then he didn't die physically for sins. That's Isaiah 53, 11. That means he's alive. He's thinking there's knowledge in his head. And it's the knowledge in his head that paid for sins. Well, how'd that knowledge get there? Well, we know in John 14, God the Holy Spirit put it there. Okay, then it's not a good deed by Christ. He agreed to it. But why wouldn't you agree to something that's good? How can you cr take credit for the good that you get from somebody else? So who did the good deed? God the Holy Spirit to Christ. Okay, but God the Holy Spirit didn't pay for sins. The sins got paid for because the knowledge of God, the Holy Spirit, put in Christ, was in Christ when God the Father imputed the sins to Christ inside his soul also. So then inside his soul went your sins, my sins, everybody's sins. And inside his soul also was the knowledge that the Holy Spirit put there, that he wanted both. Christ wanted it. But it happened inside him. He didn't produce it. He received it. He received the knowledge from the Holy Spirit. He received the sins inside his soul from God the Father. And that action paid. But he didn't himself actually do anything. He received. 
Well, that's a different role model than in that. See, it's everything is like upside down versus what we think the role model is versus what we think being Christian is versus what we think the Bible heroes were and especially what we think Christ is and what he accomplished on the cross. He accomplished something by receiving, not by doing. He became something. He, how does that go? You just threw that at me. Um... 2 Corinthians 5.21, in the same order translated in the English from the Greek, He, Father, made Him, Son, who knew no sin, comma, sin, that we should become the righteousness of God in Him. 2 Corinthians 5.21, the same word order as the Greek. He, Father, made Christ. It isn't Christ making anything. It's Father making something out of Christ. Father makes out of us. So the good deed is a God deed. And there is no other kind. That's the role model. Christ, hello. Don't we all know Christ is a role model? Okay, but what kind of role and what kind of model? Now he's perfect. But he didn't do anything. He received instead. So here we are imperfect and it doesn't matter because what is the job? The job is to receive something done to you. You are the fruit, not what you do. Fruit is a product of something else. The, the seedling turns into a tree and the tree produces the fruit. The fruit is a result. The fruit isn't producing itself. It's being done to, and it's the result. You're a result. You don't do. You're being done to. The fruit is you. God is producing you, not you producing. See, Christianity's got everything totally reversed. So yes, these Bible heroes are role models. What kind of role and what kind of model? Role, be done to. Model, be done to. And therefore, all the warts need to be presented and shown so that you can see, oh, it happened to them, so it happened to me. It happened to Christ, so it happens to me. And, you know, the warts help you understand, you know, the vicissitudes of being human. The warts help you understand, oh, I'm going to have weaknesses and those weaknesses remain till the day I die. That's what Paul was saying in Romans 7. You go right on sinning until the day you die. You don't become a better person. God does something to you alongside the rest of you. You're you. You have your strengths, you have your weaknesses. You have your good points, you have your bad points. You have things about you attractive and unattractive. And of course that's all relative and that's all, you know, perceptible. And, you know, people say you're attractive and you don't regard it that way. Or one person says, well, you're attractive because of blah, blah, blah. And another person finds that very same thing unattractive. So who cares? But right alongside all that, is what God is doing to you. Wheat and tares. Growing up together. Then you die. And the part that God made. Wow that's gold, silver, precious stones. And the part that you made. Gets burned in the fire. 1 Corinthians 3. Fire is a sort of metaphor. It's not real. End of story. So there's your role model. You're a putz and you keep on being one. Right alongside, just like, you know, the putz part is like sins coming into Christ. And then the divine knowledge part that the Holy Spirit put in him, well, that's the divine knowledge part that the Holy Spirit puts in you. Right alongside. Difference is, the sin that's in you is your own. 
It's not imputed. It's your own. There you go. So, you know, think over that. Talk to God about it. The big thing to understand is, yes, you're a role model, but what kind of role and what kind of model? And then look at the Bible and ask the same question. In each of these Bible people, Abraham, Moses, David, Hezekiah, you know, Balaam, what kind of role, what kind of model, what kind of story is the Bible telling, and what constitutes a good deed? Because where are they? Peace out.